Welcome everyone to our webinar jointly presented by FPWR and PWSA USA. I'm Susan Hedstrom, Executive Director for FPWR and mom to Jaden who is um, 12 years old and has PWS. I'm excited to be here with you tonight as we are at a very exciting time for our PWS community. Two phase three drug trials have recently been completed with encouraging results and several more drug trials will soon be beginning phase one and phase two trials for PWS. There's a lot to be optimistic for. In light of recent events, I'm sure many of you are joining us tonight because you wanna learn more about the drug approvals and where we are at with possible treatments. Our goal tonight is to help you better understand where we are in the drug development and approval process, what you can expect next, and most importantly, how to make sure the voice of our patient community is heard and understood by the FDA and by the industry sponsors. We're thrilled to have a fantastic panel of knowledgeable speakers, and we will leave plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end of today's presentation. There may be questions that we don't have answers to. However, we do wanna hear your questions and concerns so that we convey those to both the companies and to the FDA. And of course, if you have questions, we want to get answers back to you. So we will work to follow up with you once we have them. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time through the Q&A panel. And if you have a specific panelist you wish to direct your questions towards, please include their name along with your question. We have a lot to cover tonight. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Paige Rivard, CEO of PWSA USA, to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Susan, and good evening, everybody, and welcome again. PWSA and FPWR are very excited to partner tonight to bring you this webinar. <clears throat> we are committed to being the patient organization who will continue to support our families and our community and to provide you with information in a timely manner. The process of creating a collective voice, advocating to the FDA and educating our community during this time is new to all of us. And we are definitely learning as we go, but we are committed to this journey. I'm so happy to introduce to you our wonderful panelists for this evening's webinar. I, I do have one update. Dr. Jennifer Miller was scheduled to join us, but unfortunately she did have a last minute schedule change and will not be able to participate in tonight's webinar. <clears throat> Our panelists for this evening are James Valentine. James started his career at the FDA facilitating patient input into the drug review and approval process and is now an associate attorney at Hyman, Phelps and McNamara. He has helped countless rare disease organizations capture the patient experience to help the FDA understand the medical needs of those communities. <clears throat> he, was, he has worked with the PWS clinical trial space for more than five years and has participated in FDA meetings, including working with the PWS clinical trial consortium. In 2019, Global Genes awarded James the Rare Champion of Hope Award for Advocacy. Next, we have Teresa Strong. Teresa is co-founder and director of research programs at FPWR. She is a member of the FDA Engagement Collaborative and a mom to a young adult with PWS. Next, we have Rob Lutz. Rob is a biotechnology executive and he is currently the CFBO at iBio. Rob is a board member of PWSA USA and chair of the research committee. Rob also has a young adult daughter with PWS. And lastly, we have Alicia Secor. Alicia has held a number of leadership positions in the pharmaceutical industry and is currently CEO of the biotech startup Atalanta Therapeutics. She has been part of the PWS community since 2014 when she was chief commercial officer at Zafgen. She has been on the board of directors at FPWR since 2016. Again, I would like to welcome everybody and turn the webinar over to James to get us started. James. Thank you, Paige, and good evening to everyone. Uh, here from uh, me, I'm in uh, Maryland, just outside of DC, so uh, well into the evening here. But as Paige mentioned, I'm James Valentine, and for the last 13 years, I've had the pleasure of working to help ensure that 
patients have a voice in FDA regulatory decision making. As Paige mentioned, I did this first at FDA where for six years within the agency, I brought patient and caregiver perspectives into individual drug as well as medical device decision making. But I also worked there to help develop more systematic ways for FDA to engage with patients, like helping develop the patient focused drug development initiative. It's been about seven years since I left FDA, but in private practice, I've worked with both drug companies as well as patient groups to navigate the FDA pre-approval gauntlet. Most of my work has been in the rare disease space where I've had success at getting uh, many different therapies approved, including the first drugs approved for Duchenne, Batten disease, spinal muscular atrophy, amyloidosis, uh, among others. I mention all of that because it's from these experiences that I've been asked tonight to share with you some of my own insights and learnings to that, so that way we can help make sure that this Prater Willie community can effectively advocate for the needs of your loved ones. I also come to you as someone who's been involved for the, uh, in the fight for PWS therapies and advancing drug development in this space for some time. I think it was about six years ago that I first met Teresa Strong and we went before the FDA to tell them that obesity wasn't the part of living with PWS that most burdened the lives of patients and families, but it's hyperphagia and all of the complications that come with it that really truly is the hallmark of the condition. I've contributed to the advancement of new tools that we can use in clinical trials through the PWS Clinical Trials Consortium, and I've even worked with several companies along the way. So through all of that experience, I know the dire need for effective treatments, not just cures, but also things that can help provide some relief now. I also understand that even a chance that a drug will work is worth a shot. So with all of that, I wanna spend some time with you setting the stage for how I think we can work together as a community to do this. It's not just who is the loudest that makes the biggest impact, but in my experience, really who provides the meaningful input that can give FDA information that they need and actually unlock their ability to be flexible. But before I talk about advocacy itself, I first wanna say a little bit about where we are today. FPWR and PWSA have done a great job uh, in investing in research and advancing discussions that have helped really de-risk drug development. I know that you have a whole pipeline of potential drugs that are being developed and that you all should be really proud of all of that work that you've done. I'm sure you all have seen that diagram that shows the phases of how drugs get developed. Phase one, phase two, phase three. And for the first time, this community is really at a place where you have multiple drugs that have now read out their phase three studies. And these studies show promise that these drugs are really helping patients. Are these benefits 100% clear cut? No, and we wouldn't expect them to be, especially in rare diseases like PWS. There's so much that makes it harder for our clinical trials to give us black and white answers. First off, there's not many of your loved ones in the world that have PWS. This is a rare condition after all. So we can't run the large studies that are powered to be able to de detect even the smallest of changes. There are other challenges in rare diseases like PWS too. We're using novel endpoints that you know, we may or may not be particularly good at detecting changes. Also, there's so much variability from one patient to the next that there's a lot of noise that that adds into the data. And on top of that, we have COVID-19, which has disrupted the routines of your loved ones and your families in ways that we would really expect to confound the results even further. So all of this works against us having trials that answer our question of whether the drug works. And like in so many rare diseases, you're faced with studies that didn't meet statistical significance on their primary test for drug benefit. But when you look at these data in total, it shows that there may be real benefit. Is there uncertainty of whether the benefit is real? Yes. Does that mean that it's not good enough to approve? Not necessarily. FDA has the ability to exercise uh, flexibility that accounts for your community's desire to have access to drugs, even when there's less certainty in drug benefit. So you are probably asking, so has FDA already decided whether these results are enough to approve these drugs? And the answer is no. And I have to say the process isn't that simple. In order for FDA to determine whether to approve or deny an application for a drug, a drug company must first submit what's called a new drug application or NDA. 
And before they do this, they need to meet with the, the companies need to meet with the FDA to discuss the data from their studies and determine if there's, uh, the data is adequate to support the submission of that new drug application. In rare diseases, when the data aren't black and white, this can take some time. The process goes a little something like this. You know, a company will submit a request for a meeting. That meeting, if granted, takes about 60 to 75 days um, from when the meeting was requested to be put on the, the calendar. And then after the meeting, it takes another 30 days for FDA to issue the mi meeting minutes that describe the agreements that they've reached with the company. So what we're talking about is really a three month period to have a single interaction. And this may seem like a long time, uh, but there needs to be time for FDA to review background materials that summarize the data. And remember FDA is scheduling these meetings so far out because they have to provide oversight to drugs that are in development for thousands of diseases. At any one of these meetings, FDA may find certain analyses to be positive and others not. And they may ask questions. They may also request additional analyses. And so while the FDA may, in a meeting, not agree that any particular analysis supports that company submitting an NDA now, it doesn't mean that they aren't open to discussion discussing the data more. But remember, that triggers another three-month process while the company runs those analyses and then requests another meeting. And this is very important because while I know every single day matters to each and every one of you, I don't want you to think that because you heard that one analysis wasn't accepted or it's taking a long time between updates, that that means that, that FDA has rejected the drug. That's just not true. The hope is that eventually FDA and the company will come to an agreement so the company can submit its NDA and then FDA will agree to a file that NDA. And that filing of an NDA is the first step that helps enable a review. And it's during that step that FDA has to determine whether there's enough information to even support a review. And that's why it's so important for companies to have these meetings so they can agree what information is needed to be included in their application so that FDA will agree to support their review. And just so you know, once that application is under review, it takes then either six or 10 months for FDA, actually, FDA to actually do that review. And uh, that's when FDA actually gets access to all of the underlying data so they can analyze it themselves. And it's not until the end of that review that FDA makes an ultimate approval decision. So the bottom line is that is not a fast process. And I think we can all agree on that. But there are several points in time during this process where your voices are gonna be needed. And I know that's why we're really here tonight. And that's where each and every one of you will also come into, come into this. So let me share some of my thoughts based off of my experiences over the years. First, I wanna say that really a unified voice is so, so much stronger than many individual voices. I know this from when I was at FDA. When FDA hears from many people, the message gets lost. The staff have to focus on keeping track of the various inputs. And most of those messages won't give the type of information that FDA really needs to hear from patients. And this is why FPWR and PWSA have actually joined forces and why they're working to bring all of your voices into what they're doing. As an example, many of you saw the survey that recently asked for your input on uh, around the value of future drugs. This is going into a comprehensive patient voice submission. It's gonna be an input, input submitted by FPWR and PWSA that's gonna speak volumes by first framing the key issues and the needs of this community. And specifically, it will address difficulties interpreting the data, especially in light of COVID, and why those are not a concern to this community given the results of certain analyses. But those advocacy mes messages will be amplified by the thousands of responses collected in the survey that are being both summarized as well as directly provided to FDA. When FDA gets that, they won't be able to ignore the feedback they're being provided. Feed that is feedback that is very specific to the issues FDA is faced with. That leads me to the second topic, which is to be data-driven. FDA has to consider the data before it. So it's so important that this community speak to that data and what it means to you. Saying that you need something because you have nothing 
that's not going to move FDA. Asking or even demanding for approval, that won't help either. What we need to do is convey patients' needs, preferences, risk tolerance, and meaningful impacts of new treatments in a systematic way. FDA then can consider your input as data. This is called patient experience data, and FDA has to consider it as part of its review. So I'm here with you tonight as someone who's committed to working with all of you through PWSA and FPWR to leverage the longstanding relationships that these organizations have with FDA. They are credible, and because they've done so much work with FDA uh, when drug to approval decisions weren't on the line, FDA knows that they are in this not just for one drug, but for all drugs. And so when they do say a particular drug is needed and explain why the data supports access, then they have avenues to be heard by FDA. And like the last call to action, where we asked you to provide comments to support arguments that, they are, that the organizations are making to FDA, there will be more call to actions to come. Some will come sooner, others will come later. For example, if we are successful in having FDA review any NDAs for these drugs, then there may come a time where FDA takes that drug to a public advisory committee meeting, and there will be a need for you to show up and be heard during the open public comment portion. We need to be strategic about when and how we advocate. So I ask you to look to your organizations as we come up with very targeted activities. I know it's hard to stand by while these conversations uh, between companies and FDA occur, but we will keep the drum beating and do those things that I've seen help get drugs approved. It's hard to know exactly how things are working because FDA can't talk to us in the community about confidential information. But I know FPWR and PWSA will continue to engage closely with the companies and we'll know when it's time to do more. Remember again that all of this occurs in essentially three month cycles. So no news doesn't necessarily mean bad news. At this point, I'll turn it over to Teresa, who I know is gonna share some more specifics on the different advocacy efforts your organizations have taken and those that they're currently working on. Teresa. Great, thanks so much, James. It's really great to hear your perspective. I think for us, you know, this is all new for us. We have never been at this point where, you know, there, there's phase three data that is, you know, got some encouraging results. So it's great to have someone, um, you know, sort of giving us advice and helping us navigate this, this time. So I thought I'd just take a couple of minutes and give a little bit of more specific background about the type of data and information that we have provided to FDA to this point and what we'll be uh, also providing with respect to this specific issue around the impact of COVID on uh, phase three clinical trials and the needs of the community. So as James mentioned, uh, we being PWSA and FPWR have been um, you know, having discussions and uh, with the FDA now for several years. Really this started um, when Zafgen was moving into phase three trials and there were other companies on the horizon that were gonna be starting some additional trials. And we thought it was important for the FDA to uh, really learn more about PWS. So as many of you know, sort of in a historical context, PWS is thought of as a childhood obesity uh, disorder. Um, but as we all know, hyperphagia is really one of the most difficult uh, challenges of PWS and individuals who are healthy weight can also have hyperphagia. So, you know, just getting that one concept across to FDA initially, I think was an important thing to do. And, you know, the good news is they were extremely responsive to that, that message. And keep in mind, you know, these are uh, physicians and scientists um, and they are dealing with drugs on hundreds of diseases and there's 7,000 rare diseases. So even though, you know, they're familiar with these diseases, the patient community can provide the context and the information that they need to really understand, um, you know, particular symptoms and particular aspects of, uh, you know, how drugs might impact patients. And this time around 2014, 2015 was also a time that FDA was really ramping up on its um, patient focus and its ability to take in patient experience data. And so through the PWS Clinical Trials Consortium largely, um, we did, have done over the last uh, few years, we've done a number of studies that are answering the questions 
and providing the information that the FDA wants. Um, so for example, we did a survey that asked, uh, some of you may have participated in, in, in late 2014 about what treatments you wanna see, you know, what aspects of PWS do you think should be treated? What's the impact of PWS on your lives? Because you know, that's all information that the FDA takes into account when thinking about you know, prioritizing drugs and, and prioritizing treatment effects. Some of you may have also participated in a survey by um, Dr. John Bridges, who does this sort of thing much more formally. And um, he was looking at treatment preferences and more than 500 of you um, responded to that. And we, we were able to show FDA with, you know, now a big batch of data that families want hyperphagia treated, but there are also other aspects of PWS that are very important and families would like treated like anxiety and temper outbursts. So it's, it's, it's not news to any of us that hyperphagia should be a really important, you know, one really important thing to, to treat. Um, but I think, you know, having that data from more than 500 families and being able to share it with FDA is really important. So, I mean, it's very important to share personal stories with FDA because they are, you know, after all, they're, they're humans and, you know, they, they can really, you know, put things into context. But they're also scientists. They like hard data. They like to see what is the variability in the population. Um, you know how similar are the the thoughts across the population. And you know there's no right answer, but they like to understand that when they're considering a, a drug for approval. Um, we also did a risk, risk tolerance, and that showed that uh, families are willing to accept some risk in the drug if they get even a moderate uh, relief from the hyperphagia. And that's a really important point for you know, some of the drugs that we're talking about now that are you know, uh, in clinical trials or just completed clinical trials. Um, so all of that information is really important for any drug that comes down the line for PWS. And, you know, our hope is that, uh, you know, or, or the FDA, as, as James said, is obligated to and wants to incorporate that information into their decision making about the risk benefit of a particular drug for the PWS population. But speaking now about the specific situation that's in front of us, um, where um, you know, Salino has publicly shared, uh, they're a publicly held company, and so they have reported out that the FDA has um, is requesting additional clinical trials. We know Levo Therapeutics has uh, also completed their uh, clinical trial and likely having similar discussions uh, with FDA about readiness for a new drug application. Um, we wanted to share with the FDA at this point the impact of COVID on our families uh, so that they could understand that this likely impacted the data and the clinical trials that were ongoing and also reiterate the needs of the community, the uh, tolerance of our community uh, in accepting some level of risk and our tolerance for uncertainty of benefit. And so we've pulled that information together to submit to FDA along with all of the comments that um, all of you submitted about the needs of the community for treatment, as well as, um, you know, for those of you who are specifically in the, the uh, Salino trial, those comments, as well as the comments of some of the clinicians who ran the trial about the specific benefits that they, uh, they saw in their, their loved one with PWS. So we are submitting all of that information um, to the FDA, again, talking about the unmet medical need, which is really important for them to understand, um, and you know, the impact of COVID. So all of you who were in the registry and completed our survey on the impact of COVID have provided a lot of data that is supportive of um, you know, what, what Salino has said, which is, that the COVID, the pandemic and the lockdown likely uh, influenced um, some of the, the, the later data in, in that clinical trial. Um, so I just want to um, end by saying that, you know, your contributions, you have been, maybe you didn't know it, but you have been advocating all along. If you participated, if you participate in the registry and complete those surveys, if you have completed any of the other surveys that we've done on treatment preferences, on caregiver burden, all of that information is being pulled together and shared with FDA so that they can understand the PWS community, they can understand the needs of the community, and they can use that information. So, um, 
We look forward to continued discussions with the FDA. We will keep you abreast of you know, what we know and share that with you. Um, we'll also be continuing to advocate with uh, all of the companies that are developing drugs uh, in the PWS field and also keep you abreast of those conversations. Um, it's a really interesting time in the PWS community. I really feel like we're at an inflection point. There's a lot of really great stuff on the horizon and um, we look forward to the continued discussion. I'll turn it over to Rob Lutz now who will um, continue with some uh, insights in, on the, on the uh, sponsor side. Thanks, Teresa, I appreciate it. And good evening, everybody. Um, as Paige mentioned, the reason I'm here on this call tonight is primarily because of my daughter, Isabel. So just as background, Isabel is 21 years old, and although she's happy, uh, on most days she's happy at least, uh, and now lives quasi-independently, I dream all the time about helping her optimize her happiness, giving her more flexibility and options in her life by having drug treatments that will be able to assist her. So um, I've been dedicated to that mission since she was first diagnosed. And in, in fact, it led to um, changes in my life multiple times that, that led me to this panel ultimately. So, um, so besides that, uh, as mentioned, I've been a long time member of the, of the Prader Willie Board on the research committee. And uh, although those are both full-time jobs, um, to earn a living, I'm also the CFO of, of a biotech company that Kate mentioned. And so that gives me a unique perspective. So I'm in the relatively unique position of living part of Willis syndrome every day with my daughter, but I also am on the other side in, in that sense in that I work at a biotech company. I work, I've worked at companies that pursue drugs for rare diseases. And although I'm not a scientist or a regulatory expert, uh, I have a front row seat to the drug development process. And so um, I can sort of straddle a line between a PWSA, uh, you know, expert at home and also from the perspective of a drug company. So some thoughts on, on our advocacy efforts from that perspective. So first, the good news, uh, in my opinion. Um, over the years, I've seen that the FDA is increasingly interested in the voice of patients and caregivers. Um, they, they definitely want to hear from the community, and that gives us an opportunity to help influence their thinking. And you heard already about the ways we've done that historically, and we'll continue to also, for perspective, I think we should recognize that um, I see, have seen in my work other rare disease advocacy groups, and we should be incredibly proud of the work we've done as a combined community. We are way more organized than many rare disease advocacy communities uh, that I've seen, and the work we've accomplished, as Teresa noted, is, is notable. We've made progress. And we're not going to stop. We need to keep that up, but it's important to note that we've done a lot already, and we're in great position. Another bit of good news is that drug companies or drug sponsors, they, they want to work with patient advocacy organizations. So um, they will listen to our input. Um, and we provide help to them all the time. We provide input on trial design. We make introductions to product really experts. We help them enroll their clinical trials. They need and want us to, to work with them. And so um, they understand that, that what we do there is critical for them. And and it's also important that, that we do that, it helps us. So we do a lot to keep in close contact with them and keep up with their progress uh, as best we can. Now for the bad news. So unfortunately, both the FDA and drug sponsors have constraints that we need to recognize and, and ultimately work with. So you know, the FDA ultimately, as both James and Teresa mentioned, needs to ensure that drugs are safe and effective pursuant to rigorous scientific evidence no matter how desperate the need for drugs are. Um, and you know, no one can control biology and science. And we need to recognize the FDA has an important job that helps protect our community and other communities. That's what they're there for, is to make sure that, that drugs are safe and effective before being approved. And we need to recognize and honor that. Um, now, I, given that, I believe we should work to doggedly remind the FDA of the need here, because that is important. This is, this, we, have our, we have a high degree of unmet need in our community, and we continue, we should continually advocate for that and make sure that as they're considering the, the risks and benefits of any given drug for Potter Willis syndrome, they understand how much the benefit could be if, if a drug were to be effective, and we should continue to do that. But, but these are constraints we need to recognize. 
Um, as Teresa mentioned, uh, drug companies have investors and other corporate obligations, um, especially if they're publicly traded. And they typically can't and don't share all of the information they have uh, with us, with advocacy groups. And that's just not going to happen and something we need to recognize because they have other obligations. And some may be more open than others, but we need to work with them. And the good news here, luckily, is they're aligned with us. They want the same thing we want. They want their drugs approved as quickly and as, as efficiently as possible. So we're very much aligned with them. So even though they won't share everything, we can at least rest assured that, that they want to work with us. So ultimately, unfortunately, we can't know exactly what dialogue is happening between the FDA and drug sponsors. Um, the FDA is, it can't reveal those discussions by law and drug companies, as I just mentioned, often keep those conversations to themselves for a variety of reasons. So we will never have full information about the process. Um, and it's a long one as, as James discussed, um, but we can work closely with, with both the agency and drug companies to, to keep an eye on things and to help them despite this lack of information. So in, in a nutshell, despite those constraints, you know, I'm on board, we should continue to advocate aggressively for drug treatments if the data suggests that the drug works and works safely in Potter Roy syndrome, based on clinical evidence, we should be very forthcoming and, and, and work with companies and the agency to get drugs approved. But I think given the constraints and given the other backlog background you've heard today, we don't gotta to work together to channel our energy and passion in the most productive way possible. And what that means to me is we have to continue to work with sponsors and be ready to support their efforts when we're called upon to do so. We need to continue to appropriately advocate with the FDA and listen to experts like James and others who can best advise us on how to get the messages to the FDA effectively. And then we need to continue to work to apply our energy in a coordinated fashion so it has maximal effect. We are clearly stronger working together with a unified voice and working and spreading our energy out in a, in a more spread out fashion. So with that, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Great, thanks, Rob. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Alicia Secor, and first, let me just say that it is—it's an honor to be here um, and to have the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, let me just say that you are one impressive patient community, and the partnership between FPWR and PWSA um, is a role model for other patient organizations. And you know, above all else, and. A lot of the comments that I would like to make are probably redundant and repetitive at this point uh, following uh, my esteemed panel uh, colleagues. But my, my message to you is keep doing what you're doing. You've got a really coordinated approach, a consolidated voice. You have already had such a tremendous impact um, on the FDA. And they understand more about PWS today than they ever did before. Um, for those of you who may not know, um, I'm representing the industry uh, perspective on this call, and I was asked to kind of reinforce, you know, what's important around hearing the patient voice from the FDA's perspective. Um, you know, first, Teresa had mentioned that, you know, in fact, there are 7,000 rare diseases, and everyone who works at the FDA, they're a human being, and they work really, really hard. And so it's incumbent upon all patient organizations to take the time and effort to really educate on the unmet need for each disease. And if it were not for you, um, the FDA would still not understand the burden of illness of PWS and specifically hyperphagia and that unmet need. When we went to the FDA in 2014, we didn't have a validated instrument to measure hyperphagia, but we do have one now because of that study and other industry sponsors are using that in their clinical trials. Um, the FDA, to Teresa's point, thought that Prader-Willi syndrome was really just a disease around obesity and it took a lot to educate them. And through the voice of this community, we were enabled by the FDA to incorporate hyperphagia as a clinical endpoint. Um, unfortunately, things did not work out from a safety perspective. And as you've heard, the FDA is always going to expect uh, rigorous interrogation through clinical trials. They are data-driven as they should be. Uh, they will weigh the benefit risk ratio. Um, and I guess a point around that is education to the FDA before a clinical study and sometimes after a clinical study is important. 
And again, I think a consolidated voice is, is as important. Um, you don't want a fragmented message uh, to get to the regulators. I think as you build your relationships as a community with industry, one thing to keep in mind is to spread the risk and don't necessarily gravitate towards one company and what at one point in time, but keep at arm's length and partner with all companies. I think what's most exciting now that we're hearing is that there are multiple shots on goal for Prater Willie syndrome. It is so exciting to see that since 2014, um, there may be upwards of you know eight clinical trials um, ongoing at different points, different stages. Um, I guess you know when it comes to you, you know who are dealing with PWS every day, you want to know what can I do, and you have been advocating all along. And I think Teresa mentioned that point: things that you can do to really be active. Make sure that you're in the registry, the global registry. Make sure that you get a chance to participate in clinical trials, you know, should there be eligibility uh, with someone in your family or someone that you know. Um, make sure that you're educating your, your providers, your, your phys physician provider network. Um, make sure that you're participating in all of these conversations uh, with FPWR and PWSA. I think the most important thing that I would want to say is how important a unified, consolidated voice and, and effort really is to helping you achieve the positive outcome that you all deserve and that we all want. Um, just remember that the FDA is data driven and we are generating more data now through clinical trials than ever before in the history of this disease. And you know, think back to the days when human growth hormone was approved, I think in the early 90s you know, what a great benchmark and look at the impact that it has had on the disease. And I think we all want, you know, the next product to be approved for prader willi syndrome to have a good impact, an important impact. Um, so with, with that, I would just say, you know, keep doing what you're doing, stay together and, and channel all of the, the communication with the FDA through FPWR and PWSA. I think with that and good data, you'll be able to have the most impact of all. So thank you. And let me just uh, kind of turn to the panel now and maybe open it up for Q&A. Thank you so much, Alicia and, and um, James and Teresa and Rob. We really do appreciate the content and, and information that you've shared with us tonight. We are going to open up for Q&A, open discussion. So we're going to be accepting questions from our audience at this time. You can enter your questions using the Q&A control panel that's here available to you from Zoom. Um, and we will get through as many questions as we possibly can. We're fortunate that several questions have already come in. Um, and so to get us started, people want to know, of course, about timelines. So uh, last month, Soleno um, shared a press release that the FDA is requiring an additional trial. This month, FPWR and PWSA have worked together. They're submitting um, a response letter to the FDA what can we expect next and what might that timeline look like? I vote for James to answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so I think, um, you know, a, a number of those, those questions, you know, we tried to address, but uh, maybe to put a, a more, a finer point on it, you know, when that, all that information goes into FDA, um, you know, it's, it's, there's not always an obvious, you know, uh, uh, response or an obvious impact. Um, as I mentioned, FDA, you know, can't talk about, you know, uh, drugs and development or applications in front of it. It, it actually can't even acknowledge uh, the existence of, of you know, an, uh, an application uh, that it might have before it. Uh, to the public, including to the patient community, you know. So when you know the patient community communicates to FDA, our feedback loop is through the companies. You know, the companies that are you know in this process of having these iterative meetings with FDA, and, and the impact that this community can have can be seen through those interactions that the companies have. I think you know Alicia in speaking about. The Zafgen experience. That's that's exactly what happened then. 
you know, the patient community had its own meeting with the agency. And the impact of that was then seen you know, by Zafgen in their interactions then with FDA. Um, so that's why it's important also for the organizations to continue to meet regularly with uh, you know, all of the companies in the space. You know, so that way there can be as much communication as possible. And to the degree then that more advocacy is needed, that can be picked up on. And the organizations can then you know, reach out to all of you with whatever that next call to action might be and try to then you know, continue to you know, incrementally work, with, you know, work to educate the agency. Um, you know, all of this, everything that you all communicate seems is obvious to all of you. It's obvious to your advocacy leaders, but you know, FDA's spread across many, many different diseases all of these things aren't necessary, necessarily obvious to them. And so sometimes it takes, you know, multiple times <laughs> trying to educate them um, about, you know, patients' experiences, patients' preferences, um, you know, but it's worthwhile to spend that time and energy doing that because ultimately you want FDA to be as informed as possible so they'll make the best decision possible. Um, you know, so in terms of, you know, what, what's going to happen next, well, you know, uh, that kind of has to wait to be seen, but you know, I know that you know uh, PWSA and FPWR are in the right place and talking to the right people, you know, to have keep a pulse on what's going on um, and continue to to keep advocating. Um, you know, uh, hopefully, you know that's you know uh, more more and frequent advocacy isn't needed, but you know we don't know, and if it is, then you know that that's what we'll do. Susan, maybe I can try this also. So um, we don't we don't have any private information from Soleno about their their process, right? But again, just as an industry expert, we can surmise there's sort of two paths that are going to go down. My my guess, right? Based on what we've read from their press release, right? So one is I'm sure they'll continue to advocate with the FDA and try to get the FDA to listen to the data that they have and and review it. Um, that may or may not be successful, um, but, but that I imagine is, is one path they're still trying to follow. Meanwhile, they've been told in essence, you know, according to the press release, that they should seek another trial to do more work. So my guess is they're also planning in parallel to do that. Now, of course, if that were to happen, if that's the path they have to go down, that's multi-years before they get data from another trial and then put a new package together if they're successful with the new data and then come back to the FDA for review. So. Um, we won't know which path they're on until they tell the world. Um, but that's my guess is, to, you know, it could be that they're in front of the FDA in three, six, nine months, and then that there's a year long process to review their drug, or they have to go back and get more data and then start that timeline. So we'll just have to wait and see, my guess. I just want to add one comment on top of all that. And that's true. We don't know what conversations are taking place. The industry is very private around conversations with the FDA and there's no obligation or requirement to disclose the details. But, you know, Rob's right. There's a couple of different, you know, paths that you know about. In terms of how you can make your voice be heard, I would say, you know, let Celino invite you in and or let the FDA invite you in if and when, you know, that voice is needed. Um, for any clarity on interpretation of their data or the unmet need. And, you know, you never know, but I would say if they, if they want to hear from you, they will absolutely reach out and you can have a very powerful voice at that time. Great, thank you, Alicia. We do have a line of questions in regards to certain actions that um, people would like to get your input on. First would be political pressure. Would it be effective if you know someone in Congress um, or senators to get them involved at this time. So maybe I can start. So, um, you know, at this time, you know, I think as we've laid out, you know, the companies and, and FDA are having conversations and they're working through the data and no decisions are pending, no decisions are, uh, have been made um, with regard to a new drug application. Um, like I mentioned, um, you know, kind of in the setup and a number of my panelists have kind of also described. So, you know, in terms of your kind of representatives in, in Congress, you know, um, what I would say is it's a good time to keep them up to date on what's going on, you know, let them know the status, you know, of that of, of where this community is with, um, 
you know, products in the pipeline. And those, you know, the, there are some that uh, have these, these phase three results that have read out. Um, you know, they know, you know, uh, many of them know they, they're not all, you know, as focused on, on drug development and FDA issues, but many of them that are on those committees know the process and they know that, um, you know, at some point there may be an appropriate place for them to, you know, conduct their oversight um, of the executive branch. Um, but, you know, at this point, there's not a, really an ask for you um, because, really, this is all still so preliminary. These conversations are still ongoing. So um, I would say, you know, keep your relationships, you know, keep them up to date. But at right now, there's not, not a, a specific ask. And what about um, media contacts? If, if you um, know people in, in media, is now the time to reach out to them to help spread the word? So I'm also happy to maybe start this the, uh, a response to this, but um, you know, in my experience, you know, that would not be helpful at this point. You know, F, like I said, these conversations are still ongoing. We want FDA to be very open-minded. Um, my experience is that when there is, you know, kind of uh, media, you know, kind of pressure being applied, um, you know, questioning of FDA, um, they tend to uh, kind of. Uh, have to defend themselves. And right at, right at this point, again, there's not been a decision. Um, you know, so, you know, we really want to, you know, not have anything distracting them from their conversations with companies and not feeling like they're under attack. So they need to go into a defensive position. You know, again, we really want them to be open to engaging with the community and, and continuing their conversations with companies. Great. So, um, we all know the FDA has asked Soleno to complete an additional trial. What might the reasons be for the FDA in general terms, not just specific to, F to Soleno, but why, wouldn't it, why would the FDA require more trials? Why is the phase three not sufficient? So I, I can answer that, keeping in mind that I am in no way representing Selena. I'm just know, you know what has been presented publicly. And that is that overall, the primary point, which is reduction in HQCT, when you look at all of the data, it did not reach significance. So as we've said, FDA is very, um, they're, they're very data driven. Now there were uh, pre-specified subsets, for example, those with the most hyperphagia did have a significant, significant reduction in hyperphagia. And then um, specifically what, and it's on Selino's website. So if you wanna go back and listen to the presentation, uh, another um, sort of wrinkle in, in the whole thing was the pandemic. So when Selino looks at the data for hyperphagia reduction, up until the start of the pandemic, it was significant, but then with the pandemic, it sort of, uh, it, it just got a little bit muddier. And so Salino is arguing, and again, uh, you can listen to it on their website that, um, you know, the pandemic impacted um, the later data. And as I mentioned, the, the the impact of COVID survey that we did from the community really sort of supports that general premise that there were impacts of the pandemic on how individuals with PWS were behaving. And so that's, as I understand it, uh, Salino's argument for why FDA in these unprecedented times of there being a pandemic might want to revise the way it's looking at it. That, that would not be the way they usually look at the data, but it's unprecedented times. Um, so normally they would just say, okay, it's not significant. You need to, you know, do a, a trial, maybe you design it differently and get significant results. And, and I think what we're trying to be supportive of is the concept that, you know, FDA needs to apply additional flexibility in the setting that there is a pandemic. Okay. Uh, this question is directed to Rob, um, but I'm sure any member of the panel is welcome to chime in. Why not a post-approval commitment? So why not approve the drug conditionally and then collect more information once the drug's on the market from people who are participating given the, um, the safety that has been shown to date? Right, it's a, it's a good question. And just to, just to frame it for everyone in case there's language there. So um, it, it, in some cases, right, the FDA will approve a drug 
and also require additional work to be done after it's approved and on the market to shore up that, that approval. Um, typically, though, you need to reach a certain bar, a certain level of proof in the first instance before that approval um, in order to reach the point where you get you know, additional requirements put on top, right? So if you, the FDA doesn't usually do things where they say, well, there's not really enough evidence, doesn't, we don't know enough, but we'll let you do a post-approval commitment later because they're, again, they're trying to protect the safety of, of human health, right? And they want to make sure that something's going to be work and, and be safe before they, they allow it on the market at all, even with or without a, an approval commitment afterwards, post-approval commitment. So um, I don't know why they've made this decision. Obviously, they don't share that detail, but they concluded right now, I guess, that there's not enough data, given the what Teresa just talked about, to consider approving Solano's drug independent of whether it be a, a, a trial, a, a post approval commitment or not. So, um, you know, if they, if the FDA thought it was close enough, perhaps they would consider that route. But, but for now, obviously, they're indicating that they don't even think there's enough there to consider it. And maybe I can just add something because I know it can get confusing, especially with different um, regions, and and they have different authorities, and so. You know, in in Europe, they have something called conditional approval, and it is that it's a lower bar. And if you don't quite meet, you know, the approval bar, they'll give you a conditional approval, and then you just go on to kind of fill the gap, so to speak, um, once the drug's conditionally approved. In the United States, we have something different. It's called accelerated approval, and the bar is still the same as full approval in the U.S. It's just that you're showing an effect on a different kind of outcome. So instead of showing the effect on the thing that really matters to, to patients, like for example, hyperphagia, um, then you're showing something that's kind of short of that. It could be a biomarker, like some kind of um, imaging or laboratory measure um, of, of something in the disease process that, that predicts um, the ultimate clinical outcomes. Um, and, and in that case, you have to meet that same you know, bar of it being um, substantial evidence, which mean, you know usually FDA takes to mean at least one, but usually two positive studies on your primary outcome. But it just allows you to do it on that that surrogate endpoint, which usually you can measure and read out on sooner than a clin an ultimate clinical outcome measure. And so, um, so accelerated approval, um, you know. You don't, companies don't have to say my program, my drug is an accelerated approval drug or my program, my drug is a full approval drug. That's something that FDA can consider when it's reviewing a new drug application. And if they do decide, oh, this does meet accelerated approval and that's how we want to approve this drug, then they could require that post-approval study. Um, you know, so you know, there, there's a, it's more limited in the United States, the circumstances, um, but there, that is, you know, an option that could be on the table, depending on what, you know, if there is that type of surrogate outcome measure, that could be the basis of an approval. Great. Um, a, a slightly different line of questioning. We have a couple like this. Is there a precedent for any drugs being um, approved in the context of COVID? So has, we, we can assume COVID has impacted other drug studies. Have any of them been able to get approved with COVID data? Don't I don't, no, I'm no, not I aware don't. of any at this point. Yeah. I mean, I think the FDA has indicated that they're going to try to apply additional flexibility yeah. uh, on trials and that could be the number of patients or the, the data as you know, Teresa described that might be confounded. Um, but I don't, it's very early days, uh, and I don't know that we, we have specific data as to whether or not they've done any of that or not. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, considering that the drug approval process, even after the NDA submission is, you know, six to nine months, we're probably not out far enough to know. Um, a similar line, again, of questioning, comparing PWS to other um, potential um, communities. Have patient organizations other than in the PWS community successfully convinced the FDA to change their decision in situations like ours? Have they, has, have there been 
successful advocacy efforts. I think there are a lot of examples of successful advocacy efforts. I don't know that there's um, a, a case study similar to the Salino uh, situation. Um, I think there are examples where an NDA is under review and there is a, a, a panel that assembles um, to make a recommendation to the FDA, at which point the panel opens up the floor and lets the patient advocacy groups come in and, and educate. Um, and they can be very influential. I think there are some examples that we can learn from um, and I guess be deliberate about how we want to engage with the agency when it's our turn. All right. So, you spent a lot of, oh, I'm sorry, James, did you have something? Yeah, I, I would just add that, yes, there's lots. And I mean, even within this community, there's examples. I mean, you know, kind of uh, a few of us have mentioned the one where, you know, FDA did a complete 180 on what, you know, it was going to require as primary endpoints in clinical trials for prader willi syndrome. And it didn't matter what any company said to them in terms of what those endpoints should be. It took the patient community going in and educating them, you know, bringing survey data, bringing testimonies uh, directly to the agency, you know, in this coordinated fashion. And they, you know, proactively told companies that they should now start measuring hyperphagia as a primary endpoint. Um, so there definitely are examples where FDA um, really does learn something from the input that it hears from patient communities and changes its thinking. And I think, you know, some of what, you know, this, this, you know, kind of comprehensive submission that, that the organizations are working on right now to go in that includes your testimonies of, from those of you that were in, you know, uh, the study for DCCR, you know, that that input, you know, adds additional color and context. You know, we can't capture everything that was um, in, in endpoints in clinical trials and rare diseases. We don't know all the things that are going to change, you know, that patients might experience as a result of an investigational drug. And so, you know, hearing your testimonies, your, you know, experiences, that helps round out FDA's understanding. If they're struggling with whether something in the data is meaningful to a patient, they can look to that, that now data that they're going to have, you know, from the organizations that you all individually provided, and they can look at that. And that's going to help them understand what the drug effect was and whether it's meaningful to patients. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Your voices matter. And, F and I've seen it many times where FDA, um, you know, changes where it is setting the bar based off of what they learn from patients. So I, I, sorry, I would just agree with that, uh, James, you know, that the interactions with the FDA that I've been part of, I mean, they really you know, they take their job very seriously and they are trying to get safe, effective drugs that are meaningful to patients. And so they want to hear what is meaningful to patients and they want to understand the risk tolerance and the degree of uncertainty. And, you know, I, I think that they're very responsive to that. Has a, um, has a drug ever been approved based off of its secondary endpoints rather than the primary? Yes, there's, there's lots of examples of that. Um, there, there's examples where drugs were positive, the primary endpoint was positive one study, but not in another, where you had one study and, you know, had two endpoints, one was positive, one was not, where there's been, you know, the, it was only the secondaries that were positive. Um, you know, in rare diseases, you, you, you know, it's much more common for FDA to look at that kind of you know, totality of what's in the data. Um, you know, they just, they need to understand the context, um, you know, that there really is, this is really a serious, serious condition and the unmet need is very dire. And that this community understands that if uh, a drug were to be approved, you know, on what I'm calling like rare disease data, you know, data that isn't black and white, 
that that is that's that's something that's acceptable. You know that 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 uncertainty is something that you're willing to tolerate. You know the fact that that drug effect may not actually come true for you. Um, you know so that that is all really valuable context that then allows FDA to kind of unlock its flexibility and you know look at the data more holistically. And it doesn't guarantee any particular decision, but um, you know, I think it does change the lens through which they look at all of the data. The only thing I'd say on top of that, and I, I agree 100%, James, is that any company that has just invested millions of dollars and multiple years in trying to advance a treatment for Prader-Willi syndrome, if they see an efficacy signal, and if they're convinced that this is a, a, an approvable product, they will do everything in their power to negotiate a path forward with the FDA. And that's why I, I mentioned before, you know, wait for the invitation, because if that data is compelling enough to the sponsor for them to negotiate, they will invite you. Alicia, that's a great point. And that really leads into the next question, which is how can patients speak directly to the FDA? When is the patient voice most effective? And what if activities are most effective? And conversely, what activities are not effective? <laughs> well, we could spend a long time. I mean, so I'm gonna again, put a plug in for the global registry that pooling that data, because again, FDA is really, one of the things they're interested in is you know how variable we know PWS for one person is not the same as PWS for another, and they like to have an understanding of that. Like, what is the degree of severity, and how does that vary across the population? And so, by contributing your data to to um, you know those kinds of questions, we can help the FDA be really informed. I mean, hyperphagia it, is it for you know many families, but for other families, it's not right. So, so we want to be able to represent represent everything to the FDA. And, and, you know, I think when all of us have the opportunity to talk, talk to FDA, we want to make sure that we're representing the full breadth of the community. So my plug and, and others will have other things that we can do, but my plug will be to participate in the global registry. When you see these surveys where, you know, I know it's annoying, you, you fill out a million things, but please do stick with it and give us that information because it's really incredibly important for these discussions with FDA, so. So I'll, I'll just jump in here real quick. And, and this is kind of what I tried to say during, during my, my introduction is, you know, it's very important that we stay aligned. We are a small group ultimately, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're a rare disease community. Um, we're very energetic and passionate. And the best thing we can do is channel all that energy and passion into, into the tip of the spear, if you will, right? So we apply the tip of the spear to the right place at the right time. And to do that, we need to work together across our organizations and we need to work together with the sponsor companies so we know when and, and how we can best do that. Because again, we're not privy to all the information. We don't know exactly what conversations Solano or Levo or others are having. So um, we need to be on deck and ready to, to, to pull the trigger and bring that energy. We need to, to, to organize that and channel. I think, I think the wrong answer is to go off on our own and start willy-nilly calling people and calling the media and doing other stuff because then we're going to spend this energy in a, in a disparate way that will not ultimately leverage our, our, our group and our, our voice into the right place at the right time. So maybe I can put this to Teresa and Paige, but for people who are online tonight or watching this recording, you know, where can they best hear about, you know, calls for action? Obviously they heard about, they're involved in some way because they heard about this webinar tonight, but, you know, if, if people are talking to others in the community and, and they want to know how can I, you know, know, you know, when it is that I need to provide my input, I don't want to miss that opportunity, you know, to have my voice heard, you know, like, you know, we just had an opportunity, um, you know, what is the best way for, for people to kind of get into the, the loop here for you know uh, these ongoing advocacy efforts. Um, for our organization, for PWSA, we actually you know through our website um, we will always have information out there. We have a weekly newsletter that we will you know do any call for action there. Um, so people are welcome to go to the website and sign up for our newsletter. Um, and that, those are the, the primary ways. We also have you know. 
Both of our organizations have Facebook groups that we post information in. So there are multiple avenues to get involved. And um, I mean, from FPWR's standpoint, same thing. Social media is always good. We have, you know, email blasts. So, you know, please feel free to sign up for the email. I think we, you know, we, we do try to make sure there's, there's so many social media platforms now that we're hitting all of them so that, you know, no, no matter uh, what form you use, hopefully you will see it. I, I will also say that, you know, FPWR and PWSA, uh, you know, as we have for, for years now, and it's not always out there in front of people. And so perhaps people don't appreciate it, but we do keep these channels open and, and you know, we work together, especially on, you know, these, these critical issues that we know that we have to have a, a good consolidated voice. So, you know, we stay in touch with each other and, and are, you know, hopefully coordinating these, um, the, the, the pushes out to the community so that if you, if you don't hear from one, one of us, you'll hear from the other, uh, you know, pretty much around the same time. Great. Um... Who does the FDA want to hear from? Do, do they want to hear from people who participated in the trial or do they want to hear from other people in the community? And when would it be appropriate for those um, experiences to be shared? I think again, you know, both voices or all of those voices are important, right? So, and, and you know, even the voices from people who have, you know, super severe hyperphagia and the people who don't, again, so that we can understand the breadth of it. So, I mean, in this particular case, when we're talking about any specific product, obviously the people who have, you know, been taking the product are, are you know, the, the most relevant voices. But with respect to things like risk tolerance and, you know, what is, you know, how many people in the community are interested in taking a particular drug? I mean, that's obviously important for a sponsor. Um, and in understanding things like the unmet needs across, um, I mean, everybody needs to contribute to those discussions. So I think, you know, at different times, different voices should be elevated compared to others, but across the board, all of the voices are really important and need to be heard. Tracy, you can confirm that the, uh, up, you know, the, the submission that you're working on does include both perspectives. Yes, it did. And we separated that out, right? So we have actually from some of the clinicians who were participating in the trial and then family and, uh, you know, of, of, of those who were participating in the trial and then, you know, all members of the community and then supporters who, you know, are not necessarily directly related to PWS, but, you know, teachers and, you know, others in the community who are interacting with our loved ones with PWS and who also are interested, you know, understand the challenges that we face and are interested in, you know, supporting efforts to have safe and effective treatments. I will add that in, in regards to the community response letter that we were, um, that we've been discussing, every comment from every parent was included in that response. It's 143 pages, a very small font. Um, but so it really does, it's, it's a, the voice of the community it includes every comment from thousands of families um, as well as every signature that was provided. And we will make that available um, shortly. Um, our goal is to get it out to everybody later this week. Uh, we've been talking a lot um, about DCCR specifically tonight, but we did have a question as well about carbotocin and where is that drug in this journey? Um, so I'll answer again with <laughs> no way representing the company. Um, so uh, as we've heard, uh, they have completed their clinical trial, their phase three clinical trial. Um, they presented those results um, at the uh, FPWR conference last fall. So there's a recording available for that if you want to go back and, and look at those results. And, um, you know, Again, they're a privately held company, so they don't have the same reporting uh, requirements to, uh, you know, to, to the public, uh, but presumably they are also speaking with the FDA about the next steps and, you know, determining the path forward. But beyond that, you know, we don't, we don't know. Okay. Uh, we've heard a lot tonight. I would just add on that front, we do keep in regular touch with, with Levo, yeah. the sponsor of Carbotocin, and we've indicated that 
Um, if they need support from the patient community, that we are more than willing to uh, bring the tip of the spear, as I mentioned before, to help them as well. Um, so we're we're on deck, and if, if, if they uh, call us, we will obviously use the communication channels we just mentioned to bring the community's energy to bear. Thanks, Rob. I, that was a really important point. Um, we've heard, you know, tonight that one very important action that every member of the PWS community can be taking is enrolling in the registry and completing those um, surveys. They've been used in the past for um, materials submitted to the FDA. They will continue to be a resource that is used as we submit information to the FDA. The question here is, how often should people be going into the registry and updating their surveys? Um. So I, I would say at least once a year, uh, once you know, you've know you gone in and, and completed, it's meant to be sort of a, a, a living medical record that you can update. Uh, so all your previous, and for most of the surveys, all of your previous answers will be there and you can just go in and, and update them and it'll uh, you know include the new information. So um, if you have uh, you know medical changes, uh, you know, and if you're like me, you forget things, you know, it might be good to go in right when there's a significant medical change and, and just update it at that point. I just wanted to say a word about the, the global registry, and I'm sure everyone in the community knows about why it's important, but, you know, to reiterate the point and the voice of the patient educating the FDA, the importance of the registry is, is critical because it's telling a story over time. And the story is, what is the natural history? What is the natural progression of Prader-Willi syndrome? And at any point in time, different data can be pulled out and extrapolated and used by a sponsor developing a drug relevant for that information. So, you know, understanding the, the true natural history of the disease is critical and the registry will help do that. But I'm sure you already all knew that. I'm just putting in a plug for Teresa. In. Well, thank you. I always enjoy the plugs. I mean, we've also used the registry to d help develop endpoints. So the uh, the PWS anxiety and distress questionnaire that was used by Levo in the phase three trial was tested in the registry. So many of you participated in that, and you know we got the the uh, we validated you know how it behaved over time, and that information is being you know is being shared with the FDA. So we use it for so many uh, different applications, understanding the natural history, understanding changes in behavior over time. 650 of you are in the path for PWS um, sub-study within the registry, which is documenting all of the serious medical events that happen in our community. And that is just such an important uh, source of information about a large population and the things that are sending our loved ones to the hospital. And again, it's really important for drug development because for example, if a particular complication comes up, a drug company will come to us and say, well, is this, you know, is it because of the drug or is it because of PWS? And if we have information about how often that happens in our population, we'll be able to differentiate that. And the other thing is as these drugs get approved, um, you know, it'll give us the opportunity to see how the natural history changes for people that are using the drug versus not using the drug. And in the long term, it may give us some, you know, some information about safety and efficacy that we would not have, you know, otherwise. So, so many reasons. Yeah. You know, so there's a saying about um, you can't see the forest through the trees. And I think, you know, we in the community were so close to this cause. Um, you know, I've been working with FWR for almost a decade now, and even, even then it was hard for me to see all of the work that we were doing and the meaningfulness of all of these surveys until we started putting together this response letter to the FDA. And, and again, I'm really proud to be able to share it with you, um, you know, the work that this team has put together to make that happen because it puts all of these resources together that all stemmed from registry data and surveys to the community because it puts together a brilliant persuasive reason for why the FDA should consider treatments and COVID and, and you know, in light of this situation. Um, we have a really great question for you um, on the panel, which is related to our population size. Is there any concern that we're going to run out of participants for these trials? I think that's always a concern in, in rare disease, um, you know, bec because on certain trials, 
you know, you have eligibility criteria, different ages, you know, different medical conditions that exclude you. And so, yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, a concern. And, and you know, I, I worry a little bit that uh, our community, you know, we've been doing clinical trials, which has been great. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard to, we've participated in a couple ourselves and, you know, it, it takes a, a big commitment uh, to participate in a clinical trial and see that all the way through. So, um, you know, that's another great place where, I mean, the only people who are going to help us get treatments are us and it is, uh, there are challenges, but, um, you know, I think we all need to at least think about if, you know, if we can participate in a clinical trial and learn about the clinical trials. Um, and uh, that's the only way we're going to move ahead with with treatments. So I don't know if others might have other. Yeah, I, I think the FDA does keep in mind the size of the community when it's asking for the data. So if we had a much, much smaller you know, disease, they would ask for much less data to some extent. But I think the big risk is time. We'll, we'll get there eventually as a community, but it could take a really long time to enroll the right number of patients. And part of that will be to Teresa's point on us to, to make sure if there is a trial that we, we all believe in, that we figure out how to make the sacrifices to participate. Um, but it, it could take a long time, and that, that's a danger that we obviously want to avoid. Going back quickly to the topic of the registry, uh, who has access to the reg to the registry information and data sets? Uh, so, so if you participate in the registry, you, you'll do a consent, and that will go through all of that information. Um, we don't share any identifying information. We share de-identified data, so just data without any information that could identify you. Um, and we have a global registry advisory board that consists of uh, academicians, uh, parent advocates, industry representatives who review every uh, data poll that we share out with outside uh, organizations. So we do share data with, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies, with, uh, with uh, academic researchers. Um, but the, the advisory board reviews every one of those and approves them. So, you know, to make sure that it is something that will benefit our community and is important to do. Um, so there's a lot of safeguards. It is uh, overseen by an IRB, an institutional review board that protects the safety uh, of uh, participants. And all of that information is in the, the consent form. And, and I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Uh, the next question is um, the in regards to the FDA's um, news that they wanted an additional trial. Is there any surprise that they would ask for an additional trial? Is this unusual? I, I would say when in the situations where they feel that there's not enough data uh, already there, that, that it's not unusual. Um, in fact, it's fairly typical that they would you know, basically tell the sponsor to go back and get more data. Um, the question is whether the data that, that Solano has collected is sufficient. That's, that's really the rub. Um, the conclusion that, it, that it's not, and once you make that conclusion, asking for additional trial is not surprising. Um, but the shame of it is, is that they've made that conclusion without a full presentation of the data. Um, and that's what we've been advocating for, is for them to take the closer look. And now, instead of forcing uh, the community to go through another trial. So, I mean, I, I, you know, worked across, I don't know, hundreds of drug development programs and, you know, you could have a study that's a positive study and FDA asks you for another study. So, you know, it is not surprising that until FDA agrees that there's enough now for an NDA that they're going to, in any interaction, ask for another study. Um, you know, there's development programs in rare diseases that are very serious, you know, so not unlike PWS, where, you know, uh, you know, a clinical trial did meet its primary endpoint, and FDA still asked for another study. And, you know, those companies, you know, just like here are going to want to meet and engage around the data and the strength of the data and what it stands for. Um, and so, you know, when you hear announcements that FDA is asking for another study, that is really not a surprise. And that's what you would expect them to say up until the point that they've been convinced otherwise. 
we've gotten a lot of questions in regards to what clinical trials are currently happening, um, eligibility for those trials, et cetera. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov is an excellent resource for all of you who are interested in participating in clinical trials or wanting to take a look at what might be available. FPWR also has a clinical trials directory, which we have tried to make a little bit more family friendly. It includes um, eligibility criteria, the ages that are um, being currently recruited for, as well as information about um, each drug study. And Paige, is there any, is there information on PWSA's site as well? There is, Teresa, yes. Yeah, and there are several, you know, uh, clinical trials that are currently recruiting. Uh, Harmony is recruiting. Uh, there's a study of uh, uh, CBDV um, in, by Eric Hollander that's currently recruiting. Um, there are other studies that are getting ready to recruit. So please keep your eye on that. I know Susan on our side is, is really good about updating our clinical trial page. And we have a clinical trial alert that you can sign up for so that when a new study opens, you'll get an email um, so that you can look at the eligibility criteria and see, and also see if there's a site near you. Thanks, Teresa. So I would like to thank all of today's panelists for taking the time to talk to us about drug approvals for PWS. We are so incredibly fortunate to have this panel of experts as resources for our PWS community so that we can rely on them for their knowledge and their expertise. Challenging days may be ahead of us as we advocate for treatments for PWS. And personally, I find it incredibly reassuring knowing that this team is working diligently on our behalf. FPWR and PWSA have been and will continue to work together jointly in our advocacy efforts. And as you heard tonight, you know, discussions with the FDA, they take quite some time. So we can expect, you know, weeks, if not months, even longer before we have any new news. However, you can be certain that we'll share any information with you as it all becomes available. And of course, should you have, you know, additional questions after today's webinar, you're welcome to reach out to us because we truly do want to make sure that all of your answers or all of your questions are being answered. So thank you for joining us this evening. This webinar has been recorded and will be made available for future viewing. Good night. Good night, all. Good night, all. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you.